August 20th, 2019, seven miles off the coast of Half Moon Bay, California, the engine of a Bonanza A36 flying 3,000 feet above the sea sputters to a stop. Another pilot, flying a Cessna 182, watches from above as the events unfold below him. What started as an apparent routine photo mission takes a drastic turn as the Bonanza glides towards the cool Pacific water below. All attempts to restart the engine prove ineffective and a water landing becomes inevitable. After successfully touching down and coming to a stop, the two occupants on board exit the aircraft and climb atop while the Bonanza quickly begins to sink into the 145 feet of water below them. Without life preservers or protective equipment, the two are left stranded and unprepared for the long wait ahead. So we're out here in the Pacific Ocean floating around. Woo! Got some uh, homemade flotation devices here in the form of seat cushions and window shades. The water's a little bit cold, but we're all right. I set it down real easy. No one got hurt. No, we're good. Is everything right? Hopefully someone comes picks us up soon. The second pilot, flying 1,000 feet above, begins to circle overhead. However, as the plane sinks to the sea floor, the stranded pilot and passenger become almost indistinguishable in the expanse of the water around them. As well, the poor radio coverage at this altitude requires the Cessna pilot to climb above to report the accident to ATC. 746 Romeo, I see you out there about 5 south of Half Moon Bay. Uh, radio's going to come in a little broken at the altitude. But uh, we're on it, we're going to get the uh, Coast Guard out there as soon as we can. This climb results in him losing the position of the pilot and passenger, before later on finding them again after descending down out of radio coverage. An emergency response is sent out. However, it will be another 36 minutes before they arrive at the accident site. This poses a serious threat for the stranded two, as the average water temperature off the coast of Half Moon Bay in August is a frigid 58 degrees. At this temperature, exhaustion or unconsciousness will likely occur within one to two hours of exposure. Although starting out fine, over time, the effects of the cold water become apparent. Oh yeah, starting to get a little cold out here. Lots of jellyfish bobbing around. We got Owen up there doing circles. Says there's a helicopter on the way. <laughs> Isn't life fun? A Coast Guard helicopter begins on its way from the San Francisco International Airport to the location of the Cessna circling overhead. The Cessna continually has to climb up into radar and radio coverage to make position reports with ATC before descending back down to maintain visual contact with the two floating in the bay. Eventually, the helicopter makes it to their location and prepares for the recovery. Since significant time has passed since the Bonanza first touched down, the stranded two are in far worse condition. The first stages of hypothermia have long set in. Fortunately, the two are able to be individually airlifted into the helicopter before departing back to the San Francisco International Airport. Here, at the Coast Guard hangar, they're able to make a full recovery from the effects of the ordeal. Although those involved likely thought this dramatic event was coming to an end, this would just be the start of the controversy surrounding the accident, and questions into what really happened. Due to the sensational nature of the accident, 
and the shocking footage recorded, it quickly began to spread on social media. As well, the story was picked up by national news outlets, bringing it to more people's attention. Although the story was originally reported as a clear accident, many quickly began to speculate online about its legitimacy. We'll take a deeper look now into the response, the reason for people's speculation, and who exactly was involved. As well, we'll cover the events leading up to the accident and what might have caused the engine to quit. After spreading online, the event sparked debate into whether or not the accident could actually have been premeditated. Those believing this specifically pointed to the history of the pilot who flew and owned the Bonanza. The owner, David Lesh, is a controversial figure and founder of Vertica Outerwear, a successful international winter sports clothing company which has often used edgy and outlandish videos to drive attention to the brand. The skeptics reasoned that the plane crash was an orchestrated event with the goal of bringing more attention to David and thus Vertica Outerwear. As well, they pointed to the pilot filming from above and David continuing to film the situation after touching down as being questionable. They argued that the footage of the accident was a little too perfect for making a sensational story that would blow up online. Some news outlets which had previously reported on the story made updates further perpetuating the online skepticism, even bringing David on for questioning. Why should people believe that this was, was not a deliberate, dangerous stunt or perhaps even a deliberate ditching of your plane in the water? If you use uh, you know, an ounce of your brain power to look at the actual situation, I think it's pretty obvious that I did not crash my brand new airplane uh, into the very cold Pacific Ocean uh, miles offshore with no life preserver. <laughs> To try to get to the bottom of what really happened, it's important to understand all of the relevant information and go over counterarguments to the areas of question. So starting with the plane itself, David Lesh had purchased the aircraft in June, having it registered in July under Lesh Air LLC. This was around one month before the crash. The Bonanza was an upgrade from the Piper Lance that David had flown for several years before. Almost immediately after purchasing, he began investing in upgrades for the Bonanza, such as tip tanks, supplemental oxygen for high-altitude flying, and plans for newer avionics. The day before the engine failure, David added 66 gallons of fuel at the North Las Vegas airport before departing on a 400-mile flight over the Sierra Nevada mountains to another airport in San Jose, California. Luckily, he did not have an engine failure over the Sierra Nevada mountains, which would have required him to immediately bail out of the aircraft. <coughs> After a brief stop in San Jose, David departed on to the Hayward Executive Airport, which would be his final destination for the day. However, after his first flight, he had to keep the electric fuel pump in the low on position during the initial climb. The fuel pumps are there to provide pressure, pushing fuel to the engine. The electric fuel pump, which David was using, serves as a backup to the engine-driven fuel pump and is typically operated during takeoffs and landings. This is as a redundancy in case the engine-driven fuel pump fails. David, making a note of having to turn this on, indicates that the fuel system was behaving abnormally. At the time, he theorized that this was due to the high temperatures outside and continued the flight. Finally, after stopping for the day, he added another 20 gallons of fuel to the tanks. This brings us to the day of the crash. Before taking off, David pre-flighted the aircraft, which included sumping the fuel tanks to check for contaminants. The sumps are located at the bottom of each tank, as this is where the debris and water will collect. In the fuel was a considerable amount of what he described as a flaky black sediment. It is not uncommon to find slight traces of debris during the first sump, however in this instance this was not the case. For both tanks it took a reported 4-5 to five sumps before the fuel was completely free of debris. David knew this was unusual, however having been finally able to sump clean fuel, he assumed that the sediment had been removed. The flight departed Hayward Executive Airport and continued on to make multiple stops, picking up both the passenger and the pilot of the Cessna. This started by heading to RHV, continuing on to MRY, briefly stopping at a private airstrip, before finally stopping once again at RHV to drop off the other pilot. Here this pilot would get in the Cessna, and the two would depart westbound for the photo mission. This would be the last flight of Bonanza 134 Papa. Notably, earlier in the day, after departing RHV for the first time, the pilot reported that the fuel flow gauge was indicating an unstable fuel flow that decreased from 16 down to 11 gallons per hour. As with the departure from North Las Vegas, the problem seemed to be alleviated after switching the fuel pump on. The Bonanza and the Cessna continued westbound under flight following before this was terminated as they were leaving radio and radar coverage. 
The two took several photos before the Bonanza's engine started to fail. The fuel flow gauge and the cylinder head temperatures slowly dropped to zero. David began troubleshooting the failure, turning the fuel boost pump on to low and then high, switching the fuel tanks, and trying various combinations of the throttle, mixture, and propeller controls. Despite the engine briefly coming back to life, the efforts proved ineffective as a water landing became the only option. Taking the entire scenario at face value, a reasonable explanation for the engine failure would be the disintegration of the fuel bladder. This is a large rubber bag which lines the fuel tank, keeping it sealed. As this starts to deteriorate, pieces of it can flake off, which would explain the black flaky sediment found while sumping the tanks. As this disintegration got worse, pieces of the fuel bladder likely began to clog the fuel system. At first this may have only caused an unstable fuel flow, and the blockages could be dislodged by the extra pressure provided by the electric boost pump. However, it was only a matter of time before a complete blockage occurred. Unfortunately, this may have been the reality that resulted in the unrecoverable power loss. Some who analyzed the scenario had doubts that this is what really occurred. The skepticism into whether or not the crash was pre-planned can be broken down into three main areas. This being, David's history of performing stunts to drive attention to his brand, those involved recording each part of the accident, and what some perceived as an unrealistic reaction to the life or death situation they were in. David's history of outlandish marketing stunts include taunting a moose in 2014, which he was charged with harassing wildlife, and jumping a jeep through a burning pile of shopping carts the same year, for which he received felony charges. Since then, he has produced a variety of shocking, yet less illegal promotional content for Vertica Outerwear. Although this in itself does not prove the crash was another stunt, its shocking nature does arouse suspicion. The filming of the accident also brought many to question the intentions of those involved. Specifically, David immediately taking out his camera after he and his passenger climbed aboard the sinking Bonanza. This could have been part of a plan, or merely just to preserve the shocking moment as the two had limited power to do much else to help their situation. As well, many questioned the initial reaction of the two on camera. David and the passenger were surprisingly calm for having just been through a plane crash and now stranded seven miles off the coast in cold water. It is still worth noting that the two legitimately were stranded here without life preservers, presenting a real life or death situation. Ultimately, the unfavorable location of the crash, the consistency of the story provided by those involved, the lack of preparation in terms of protective equipment, and the heavy investment in upgrades for the aircraft before the crash leave me under the impression that this legitimately was an accident. Still, the pilot's history of questionable decisions and wild antics leave it within the realm of possibility that this event was pre-planned. Three years later, we're still waiting on the official NTSB report, which may uncover some valuable and surprising insights. As for the fate of November 134 Papa, it will likely forever remain in its watery grave off the coast of California. If you think there's more that I left out or got wrong, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. And if you made it this far, I'd appreciate it if you considered liking and subscribing. Thank you.